So good evening, colleagues. Welcome to the number 17 tourism online forum series in May 2023. This series is hosted by the Center for Advanced Tourism Research, CATS, at Hokkaido University. This is your host. My Chinese name is Chu Meng, and my Japanese name is Kyo Mo. In English word, my, my name, is, everybody call me Mo. So today we are very honored to have Professor Joseph chair to share his recent research. The title is After the Pandemic, Tourism Policy and Planning and Building Back Better. So Joseph is a professor of sustainable tourism and heritage in the School of Social Sciences at Western Sydney University in Australia. Before, he was a former professor of sustainable tourism Center for uh, Tourism Research at Wakayama University in Japan. And Professor Joseph is also uh, presently the very famous tourism journal co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Tourism Geography. So he is also a co-chair of the World Economic Forum and a Council on the Future of Sustainable Tourism. He's also a board member of Pacific Asian Travel Association, also from the industry side, the region's leading tourism industry group. So, uh, so today he's also bring a lot of a very interesting research question. One of the key research question would be, what have we learned from the pandemic and how will this change the nature of global tourism after the pandemic? And furthermore, is also uh, really see if this is a new paradigm shift or we are seeing a return to the pre-COVID-19 tourism patterns and tourist behaviors. And what are the implications for destination community uh, and a tourism system? So Professor Joseph is currently in the island nation of Wanotua. So if you're looking at a map, it's between Solomon Island and Fiji. So since there was no stable internet connection and Wi-Fi single in the area, uh, so he's a very kind prepared a recorded lecture. Uh, it takes around 45 minutes, but he will join our Q&A session after seven o'clock in Japan Standard Time. So if our audience have any questions, please leave your questions and comments to Professor Joseph in the meeting chat box. And since many audience were unable to uh, attend tonight's uh, seminar, so we will upload our recording on YouTube channel. Please notice that this online lecture will be recorded and uploaded to the forthcoming YouTube channel of Center for Advanced Tourism Research. So now let's invite Professor Joseph to share his lecture. Let me share my screen. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Professor Joseph Chia. I'm a professor of sustainable tourism at Western Sydney University in Australia. Thank you to Dr. Chu, Associate Professor Chu, for inviting me to present this lecture today. Um, as I am traveling, I wasn't able to, to provide this lecture from my office in Sydney, but instead I'm recording this lecture in Vanuatu which is an island in the South Pacific, island country in the South Pacific. Now, the reason I'm recording it is because Wi-Fi is generally slow and unreliable and it drops out every now and then. So rather than do this lecture live, I am doing it via a recording and hopefully I can join you for the Q&A session later on this afternoon. So again, thank you to Hokkaido University and the Center for Advanced Tourism Studies for inviting me, as well as being a professor here at Western Sydney University, where I started on the 1st of March. I was previously Professor of Sustainable Tourism at the Center for Tourism Research, Wakayama University in Japan. Um, I am also a board member of the Pacific Asia Travel Association, the region's largest travel association. And I am the co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council for the Future of Sustainable Tourism. So with that said, where I am today, and I think where I am today gives you a good um, example of the very issues that we talk about in tourism. And I will explain a little, little bit more about the country that I am in and why I am here and how the research is relevant to the work we're doing. Now, while I'm doing this talk, you may have a plane fly overhead, you may have dogs barking, you may have birds, and you may have tourists and staff members walking behind me 
So please bear with all of that. This is being recorded live in a hotel in Port Vila, which is the capital of Vanuatu. So let me share my screen with you first. I've got some slides that I prepared specifically for this lecture. And here are my slides. So when I was talking to Hokkaido University, the Center for Advanced Tourism Studies, about this lecture, I thought it might be good to talk about where we see ourselves after the pandemic and talk about tourism policy and planning and this whole idea of building back better. Now, as I said, you will be interrupted by some background music in here. They have some very giant lizards called geckos, and they make a lot of noise every now and then. It's currently about 5 p.m. in the evening, so within the next hour, it'll be getting dark, so I better hurry and, and get this lecture done. So with that said, this will be the focus of my, my lecture today. So what I wanted to do first is talk about some of the major issues when it comes to the, the question of sustainable tourism. So um, I will now go to full screen. So this idea of sustainable tourism is considered a paradox, right? And the question, can tourism ever be sustainable, needs to be asked. Because when we talk about international tourism in particular, we're talking about people flying on planes. And the issue of ca uh, carbon consumption and climate change is a big factor in this discussion on sustainable tourism. So how can tourism ever be sustainable if this is the business model it operates on? Also, there is domestic tourism, and very often, the more tourism we engage in, the more carbon we use. And therefore, how can tourism ever be sustainable if tourism involves highly consumptive habits? But I'll come back to this question about the growth paradox and whether tourism can be sustainable. To give you some, some ideas of, of, of where I, uh, I've been and, and the work that I've done, this is some of the work that I've done um, so far, um, we've talked when we talk about sustainable tourism, we've talked about tourism resilience, adapting to environmental change and adapting to social, political and economic change. For example, where I am today, about a month or two ago, we had two cyclones in a row. It destroyed much of the, 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 the tourism infrastructure here and it caused the industry to have to rebuild again. Um, of course, what we see is that um, you know, following COVID, where there was a major hit, uh, the cyclones have uh, had a big disruption to much of the infrastructure, but not a not a totally permanent um, impact. There are hotels starting to open up again, and um, tourists are starting to come back. But of course, there are um, uh, operating issues that are very difficult to resolve overnight. The book Over Tourism is something that we've talked about in the research I've done with colleagues a lot. To what extent do we understand the limits of tourism growth? And around the world, in the age of over-tourism, and this is before COVID, we noticed that many destinations around the world were suffering from tourism that had either gone out of control or tourism that no longer had the best interests of the local people at heart. But I think it's important that when we talk about tourism, we look at the supply chain. And this is why we did some work on looking at the incidence of modern day slavery and orphanage tourism. But of course, whenever we go to cheap destinations, whether it be in countries in the global south, such as in Southeast Asia, Southern Asia, Africa or Latin America, we often find that tourism is cheap. But when tourism is cheap relative to what we earn in the countries, developed countries that we come from, Australia and Japan, the question must be raised, why is this cheap and who is paying for this to be cheap? Um, also, we wrote about global tourism in COVID-19. Global tourism has had a significant impact on tourism, as we all know. The whole world came to a stop. But we also know that global tourism um, has changed some things in tourism, especially visitor patterns. We see that now it's less likely that people will fly long-haul flights, let's say from Australia to Iceland or from Japan to Latin America. And in instead, people are flying short and medium-haul destinations, which is very close uh, to their countries of origin. We also talk about the growth in tourism in the Asian century. We see that economic growth in Asia has vastly outstripped economic growth elsewhere, and we can't misunder, we can't under acknowledge the impact that economic growth has with tourism. And then we write about islandscapes and tourism in my latest book, where although we love going to islands, to some degree, island tourism can be the most unsustainable form of tourism because we think about islands, most of the things that take into the islands in terms of fuel, supplies, and everything else 
is it necessarily the most sustainable form of tourism is something we ask in this book. So that's my general introduction to the work that I've done. Now I want to present to you some notes from the field where I am today before we go on to discuss other things. So I'm in the country of Vanuatu, which is in the Pacific Islands. You can see on the left of the screen, Australia, um, and the red circle is where I am at the moment in the capital city, Port Vila. We see the Pacific is a vast area made, made up largely of ocean. Um, and we see that within this ocean lies a lot of small island developing countries. And within many of these countries, tourism is probably the most important industry for their economies over the last couple of decades. Japan is further north, probably another eight hours or so from Port Vila if you flew in a plane directly. So tourism in Vanuatu, a small island developing state, is largely made up of leisure tourists and cruise tourists. Here, the questions about whether tourism is contributing to development or not is a very big question, right? To what extent are the local people benefiting from tourism? As you can imagine, the COVID pandemic had a major impact on tourism here. And if we are to do what many researchers are saying, stop flying, we will see that small island countries such as Vanuatu will struggle for their livelihoods, especially if tourism is one of the major forms of livelihood. We see other destinations around Vanuatu like Fiji, like New Caledonia, like Samoa, the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea. So as a small island developing state, this, these countries are very vulnerable to climate change and they are at the front of the climate change movement where as sea levels rise, um, many small low-lying island countries find themselves inundated with the rising water that comes in. So while tourism here is seen as a mechanism for development to help the country become more prosperous and developed, it also contains a large number of problems that prevent it, that prevent tourism from achieving its aims to be a vehicle for development. In a paper written by the UN uh, Center for Trade and Development, they talked about the prospects of post-pandemic tourism and economic recovery in Vanuatu. This is a question that many, many countries are asking themselves. What does the pandemic mean for our tourism industry? Will we get it back or not? As we speak here in Vanuatu, Recovery to 100% of where tourism was before the pandemic has not happened yet. We see that the airline is suffering from uh, under-resourcing. We see that the government has other priorities to, to deal with crisis, to deal with the two cyclones that they had recently. So how can we say that tourism will be a vehicle for recovery when some of the most basic needs in the country are not being met yet? As as the, the next slide shows, here no one was prepared for the crisis. And that, and that as well as the, the economic crisis from the pandemic slowdown, we see the ongoing feeling, the ongoing impacts of a climate crisis in terms of water, in terms of um, uh, more incidents of extreme weather events like cyclones. And how can small island countries that rely on tourism deal with the vulnerabilities that they have? and resilient to a lot of the climate change effects that are impacting their tourism industry. And at the same time, we see, according to some of the researchers like Regina Shavens and Afi Salome Mubono, that there is now a resistance to tourism in the South Pacific. But the question is, will governments put words into action? And this is where policy and planning comes in. Governments are responsible for policy and planning when it comes to tourism. Because if tourism isn't um, uh, growing in a planned way, the question is whether local people will benefit from it, whether the environment will be protected as it should, and whether the social and cultural effects of tourism are understood fully. So that's a background to the tourism destination I'm in. As you can see out there, there's the, 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 the sea. Um, but at the moment, it's cloudy and overcast. Usually, or well, this morning, it was bright and sunny. There were birds, there was fish, starfish in the water. Um, so it doesn't look as good on screen as it does in real life. So when it comes to the lecture about building back better, it seems to me that policy and planning is vital to building back better. And there are some key concepts that we need to understand in the study of tourism. Perhaps you've already discussed many of them. So forgive me if I repeat them, but I will just go through this list very briefly. When we talk about sustainable tourism or sustainable development, it comes from the Brundtland Report, the Brundtland Report of 1987. If you, you don't know what it is, you can find it online stated that sustainable development 
was all about ensuring that the next generation inherits a planet that is in good or better a condition than what we are handing over to them. Also, there's the question of when tourism is developed, there is likely to be change. And we have to ask ourselves, so what are the limits to acceptable change? And how do we measure those limits to acceptable change? And who decides what the allowable change should be? And then there's the concept of carrying capacity. We often have to ask ourselves, to what extent can a tourist destination or a place cope with tourism? Is 5,000 tourism the extreme carrying capacity? Is it 10,000? Is it 15,000? So for us as tourism researchers and for the industry as tourism practitioners, they're constantly trying to understand what is the capacity of this place? Because at some point, a, a destination will reach its, it reach its capacity, which is why we see the concept of over-tourism coming up, right? Where people, local people are feeling that they are bearing the costs of growth, but they are not benefiting from the growth in tourism. Then there's this idea of sense of place. You know, as a, as a destination becomes more developed, it starts to change. It starts to become less authentic. And this is what we mean by sense of place. Tourists go to a place to feel that they are in a unique place, right? Because if I go to Kyoto and I could be anywhere else in Japan, why do I go to Kyoto? So this idea of sense of place is particularly important when it comes to evaluating uh, sustainable tourism and tourism development. The next concept, placemaking. When we talk about placemaking, we are talking about the processes where a place and its people become subject to tourism. The question is raised, who is responsible for placemaking and to what extent do local people decide how their place is represented and the type of development that takes place? Or is it the tourism industry that takes over everything? Then we talk about tourism impacts, social, cultural, environmental, um, uh, uh, and economic are the key impacts we talk about. And sometimes when tourism develops, we are talking about uh, the trade-off of impacts. We might talk about increasing economic impacts, but perhaps having an impact on the environmental impacts of tourism. So to what extent do we trade off the environment for the economic trade-offs that we receive in turn from tourism growth? Then the last point there is the newest, um, I, I suppose, discussion when it comes to tourism, this idea of regenerative, regenerative tourism. To what extent can we visit a place and leave it better off than when we first got there? It reminds me of the old um, phrase, when we visit a place, take nothing but photographs and leave nothing but footprints. So to what extent can tourism leave a place better off? So my first part of this, this lecture is the policy and planning and the responses to paradigm shifts in tourism, because everybody expects a paradigm shift to take place in tourism yet. Yet what we see is that tourism is in some ways returning to its old models that many describe as being unsustainable. So with that, I will take a backward glance and look at COVID and then work forward to see how destinations are implementing new policies and new types of planning to ensure that um, the industry, when it recovers, recovers in a manner that allows it to be sustainable um, and regenerative, if that's the case. In 2020, at the, at the height of the pandemic, we asked ourselves, you know, what will be the key to tourism recovering? At that point, we thought that making vaccines available to everybody will be the key to, uh, to a too fast tourism recovery, vaccine passports. There was also the issue of vaccine equity. Rich countries had the vaccine, poor countries didn't. How are we able to deal with the tourism situation where only people in the rich countries had a high uptake of the vaccine while in poor countries, people didn't? And how do we um, reconcile travel that people will make from rich countries to developing countries or indeed um, uh, in countries that are the same as themselves? But of course, this conversation, which is two years old, is now not as relevant as it was back then. So we found that attempts to reboot international travel on a wider scale have failed due to the successive waves of COVID-19. And it's only starting to come back now, more than a year after most borders were open. With borders closed, many countries put a focus on attracting domestic tourists instead. And while this helped maintain economic stability in countries such as China and Japan, because their citizens weren't going overseas to spend money, right? They were spending money in the country. So it kept the money in China and Japan. 
but to what extent is this going to continue to happen um, as borders rem and 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 um, a vaccine uh, requirements change? And hopes for the swift recovery of international tourism were pinned on the distribution of the vaccine, which we now know um, uh, is something that has mostly been successful in being distributed to countries around the world. We pose three questions that are important for tourism policy and planning. What travel regulations will prove effective? How will airlines restart their businesses? And will traveler confidence return? With the first question, we see that tra travel regulations uh, are, are ongoing. They're constantly changing to fit in with the changing circumstances. But what we know is that most destinations were not prepared for the pandemic. How will airlines restart their businesses? This is one of the major issues for tourism recovery. Many airlines are not back to full capacity yet. Um, and airfares are very expensive, which is discouraging the return of international travel. And the third question, will travel a confidence return? Especially in Japan, it was quite obvious that um, Japanese weren't prepared to go overseas because of the risks involved, the health risks involved. When will people return? The confidence that they had and we see that there was chaos and we see now that in in the, the 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 summer northern hemisphere summer the same kind of chaos is expected as there was last year travel regulations driven by policy have been largely trial and error in other words educated guesswork under preparedness was common and made worse by an inability to harness a common collaborative approach worldwide Countries weren't working with each other. They were working on their own to procure vaccines for their own people, but not for others, and, and not um, realizing that in a global world, we are all together on this. Vaccine equity, vaccine passports, and non-discriminatory requirements were especially prominent, especially anti-Asian sentiment that emerged in many Western destinations. And then now we talk, we, we hear of the, the pandemic leading to a global recession economic recession, how might that impact travelers in the travel industry? And this is why we need effective government policies to support the tourism industry. During the pandemic, governments provided cash subsidies to the tourism industry, cash support to, to pay for employees' wages and vouchers to stimulate domestic tourism. For example, in Japan, the go-to travel campaign was quite common. And as we see, airlines are still struggling to bring back capacity given the time lag in between making the decision to start flying again and the preparation of aircraft and crew. As a result, airfares are still very, very high. For example, traveling to Australia and uh, from Sydney to, to Kansai um, used to be about $700, but now you can't get the fare for less than $2,000. And then we see countries like Japan open cautiously Japan only opened on the 11th of October, less than six months ago. Um, and they were worried about bad mannered foreigners who weren't sticking to health protocols, simple things like wearing a mask, sanitizing. And of course, we see key marks in Asia um, trying to convince their citizens that travels abroad should resume. We see governments are searching for pathways that lead to rapid economic recovery and increased social engagement while striving to maintain public health and pandemic protocols. And governments mostly now have border entry requirements that have been removed. They recognize the urgency to reassure citizens that pandemic management was being exercised and that travelers weren't going to be carriers of coronavirus contagion again. But this raises all, a lot of questions, right? Will we ever be prepared for the next pandemic? We also found in countries like Japan, policies that building confidence in destination communities and the tourism supply chain were important. Um, policies on economic assistance to businesses to provide way, uh, replacement for wages and, for, and for, for travelers, policies around the requirements to meet the pandemic protocols, whether they be tests, um, certification or, or something else. The more barriers we have in place for travel, the more unlikely people will travel. And this question is one that we should ask ourselves as a tourism industry. Are we going to be ready for the next COVID wave or the next pandemic, whatever it might be? Because we now know that a global pandemic has major 
uh, implications for the global tourism industry. So when people say there has been a paradigm shift, we have to ask ourselves, has there really been a paradigm shift or are we seeing a return to tourism patterns from before COVID? Early indications now over the Northern Hemisphere summer demonstrates that tourists have returned and are returning in force. We see that flights between um, North America and Europe are almost back to 100% of what it was in 2019. But demand for inter international travel has still been impacted by multiple factors. The effects of the Russia-Ukraine war continue to underlie security fears. Cost of international travel remains comparatively high, and this is associated to energy costs and supply chain constraints. And we also see the fears of a potential economic US-led global recession. What would happen if a global recession started in the US and continued elsewhere? That would surely have an impact on tourism. So for us as a tourism industry, it's very difficult to plan and make policies because there are many unknown variables that will um, that are likely to emerge. And we ask ourselves now, when will COVID stop being a global emergency? Many people say that COVID hasn't really gone away. We have seen the highest number of infections in many countries across the world. Um, and the World Health Organization says they cannot say that the public health emergency is over when millions of cases and thousands of deaths are still occurring on a daily basis. You know, what does this mean for international travel? What signal is it sending to researchers, to manufacturers, and to investigators developing new drugs and new vaccines? Is it, are we going to experience something bigger and worse? And the second dot point there, can we say that tourism has returned when the largest market for international travel, China, still remains subdued? Although in Japan, the reports are that they are starting to come back slowly. But most um, forecasts are that tourism in the Asia Pacific will not recover until 2024 until China's borders open. In 2019, before the COVID-19 outbreak, 154.6 million Chinese traveled outside the country. And there's a plane going overhead, so excuse me for that noise. This is what happens when you do a live presentation from a tourism destination. And this idea of, 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 of um, encouraging travelers to travel again. How do we convince them that travel is safe? To what extent can we say that the spread of coronavirus is largely under control? Um, we see, for example, the World Travel and Tourism Council and their campaign Safe Travels, introducing global protocols and, and a stand book. Are some destination border entry requirements still too onerous? We have to ask ourselves this question. Although, Overall, apart from China, most countries have relaxed their border control requirements. What reaction would another pandemic likely cause the tourism industry? And as a result, we see that caution against international travel remains high for travelers. To what extent will confidence return is something that the tourism industry is asking themselves. The last time we had a paradigm shift in tourism, we saw it was during September 11, 2000, when um, planes were flown directly into uh, buildings in New York, right? That had a major impact on the way we travel. It meant security procedures were changed quite considerably. There was a time when we didn't have to take off our shoes and coats, and we could take water bottles on the plane. We didn't have to open our bags and show our computer. Um, that was the last paradigm shift because it changed tourism considerably. And there were many calls that said this will be the end of tourism. But of course, that never happened. Tourism has a habit of bouncing back. So travel patterns have changed as a result of the pandemic, but have they changed for good? In particular, transport systems. And we argue that for once, the governments around the world, once in a lifetime, have a chance to proactively shape how yeah. transport is delivered and used and to support and promote the most effective transport modes. Um, and of course we see things like flight shame where people are saying no more flying. If you're going to go somewhere, get a train instead. But of course it's difficult for island countries like this, where the only play way to get to the Pacific islands is to fly. Well, you could come on a, on a ship as well, but that would take a long time. So how 
do we break down the habits and, and, and attitudes that underpin so many decisions at all levels as to how, where, when, and why we travel? We see that the tourism agency in Japan, the Japanese National Tourist Office, is saying that um, travel will reach pre-pandemic levels by 2025. And their responses have focused on some of the following, adjusting border entry requirements, implementing public health support for tourism, destination marketing to, to assure potential travelers that they are safe and to encourage visitation, investing in domestic tourism, recovery through direct in industry subsidies, come on, incentivizing international tourists to return with free airfares and travel vouchers, and incentivizing domestic tourists to travel around the country via deals and discounts, such as the go-to travel campaign in Japan. We see that for the Japanese government to achieve the international arrivals of 2019 before, pan before the pandemic in 2025, they must address the following. They must restore traveler confidence, right? Because without traveler confidence, people will be reluctant to travel. They must support tourism businesses to adapt and survive. They must promote domestic tourism and support the safe return of international tourism rather than rushing domestic tourism um, for economic recovery, but not having the health policies in place. Providing clear information to travelers and businesses and limiting uncertainty. Evolving response measures to maintain capacity in the sector and address gaps in supports. So, for example, during the pandemic, many employees left the tourism industry. So as the recovery takes place, many businesses are finding themselves short of employees and employees are not coming back to tourism because they have found jobs in other industries that are paying them better. How do we strengthen cooperation within and between countries to help manage the recovery of tourism, but also deal with the crisis that comes up? And of course, building more resilient and sustainable tourism in countries is the main goal, right? And many of the dot points above talk about how we might be able to do that. As the UNWTO or the United Nations World Tourism Organization stated, international tourism is on track to reach 65% of pre-pandemic levels by the end of 2022, which they came close, and an estimated 700 million tourists traveling between January and September in 2021 equating to 63% of 2019 levels. So by the end of 2021, recovery was well on the way. And there's a you, you will hear tourism industry um, from different countries saying that there is a demand for travel um, and that with imp improved confidence levels and the limiting of restrictions, this is likely to help uh, um, the global tourism industry achieve a bounce back in 2023. We saw that when Japan opened its borders on the 11th of October, tourists re returned quite rapidly. This resulted in good economic growth. And as Julia Simpson from the World Travel and Tourism Council said, over the past two years, this is 2021 and 2022, the global travel and tourism sector had suffered tremendous losses. 20, last year, 2022, was poised for a strong recovery, and we did see a strong recovery in many destinations. The World Travel and Tourism Council also said, that the sector could recover more than 58 million jobs or 8.6 trillion. And this is why we want tourism to come back because it provides so much employment for so many. And as people start traveling again, governments must implement simplified rules, including the use of digital solutions. For example, here in Vanuatu, I still have to provide my pandemic certification to show that I've been vaccinated at least three times. Travelers without it will find it difficult getting into the destination. But how can we how can we move away from that and digitalize everything so that travelers don't have to carry lots of documents with them? They can just uh, have their their information verified when they arrive in a destination and contactless travel guarantees safety. In the Asia Pacific, this is what the Pacific Asia Travel Association has has forecasted. They said that international recovery to and within the Asia Pacific is projected to return towards the end of 2024. So far, we see this recovery taking place as China slowly opens. We see tourists coming back. We see Thailand receiving many, many Chinese tourists and already getting close to the 2019 figures. As Japan is still cautious with its tourism industry, the following policy conditions influencing recoveries have been shaped by several key factors. For example, the Japanese yen is at historical lows, 24-year lows, in fact. Uh, making Japan a very attractive destination and a cost-effective one. Border entry 
uh, to, to international tourists have opened in the last six months. And already we see really strong growth. Some in Japan said perhaps the Japanese government should have opened the borders earlier. Some COVID mitigation measures remain, especially for infected travelers to, to, be, to be quarantined and for unvaccinated travelers still to provide proof of negative COVID tests. And a focus on achieving medium to long-term growth targets are still being reinforced. For example, before the Tokyo Olympics of 2020, which happened in 2021, Japan was expecting a growth of tourists 30 million at the end of 2020, and then to 60 million at the end of 2030. The pandemic adjusted those figures, but now we hear the Japanese government saying that by 2030, they expect 60 million tourists. In other words, a doubling over a period of seven years. And we see in tourism, as tourism starts to recover, there are labor force issues. There are not enough people uh, to, to work in tourism that is part of the, um, uh, the recovery that needs to take place. In a country like Australia, where I'm based, um, tourism in Australia is seeing a very slow recovery because we see that travelers are not traveling long distances so much anymore. They are traveling short and medium haul distances. Um, in Australia, border entry requirements have been so simplified. High airfares remain a constraint inbound travel. Australia is at the end of the world, right? So how do we continue to, to improve our tourism industry if airfares remain high? As well as airfares remaining high, air capacity is constrained. So Australia is a relatively high price destination, high cost of tourism services. And Chinese outbound travel is the key to tourism recovery, but yet that is yet to happen. Domestic transport options are limited and there are tourism labor force constraints as well. So it's a good time to get a position in the tourism industry. We see that the return of tourism to Japan has seen this enormous economic growth once again, but I think I've covered most of this already, so I will skip past this slide. So while the pandemic may have grounded the world, it has also been a catalyst for change as the tourism industry considers the future of travel. The new experience proposed by travel brands reflect profound societal changes that encompass our relationship with the environment. People have said that the pandemic has made us more conscious about our social and environmental um, relationships. How we travel is not just about how we spend our leisure time, but increasingly it should reflect the values of an entire society. So my second and final part is about what all of this means for policy and planning, and especially for over tourism that has occurred over the years. So this is one example in a, in a city in Sydney that, that talks about um, uh, how without tourism advertising or without um, uh, tourism development plans, tourists find their way to popular destinations. And the question is, this is a place called Seagull Rocks in Sydney, where councils are telling tourists to stay away from the town because there'd be too many tourists. How can we plan for these things? In some ways, this is like the situation in Kyoto before the pandemic, <coughs> where tourist pollution was a problem, right? Or Kanko Kogai, where tourists were seen as polluting the natural environment of, of, of Kyoto and, and whether we had reached the limits of which the city and its people could deal with tourism. In articles we wrote about over tourism as a glowing global problem in the Spanish city of Barcelona, where that photo is taken, tourism was seen as an occupation force, people taking over a destination. Then we see um, in this book that we wrote how tourists were asking for their spaces, uh, for separate spaces to be provided for tourists and how some places within a local community should be seen as out of, um, out of bounds for tourists, you know, tourist zones where tourists are allowed to go where they don't live locally. But of course, companies like Airbnb said, you know, if you come and stay at an Airbnb, you will live like a local. But did anybody ask the locals what this means? We see the same problem happening in, in Kyoto, right? Where in some parts of Kyoto, people were, there was a, an explosion of minpaku, uh, of short stay places. How does that have an impact on um, the local people if they have no control over that? Now it's getting dark and I'm just looking behind me so that we have enough light. And then this, this, this question of over tourism occurs because of poor policy and planning. So I would encourage you to watch this, this um, um, uh, 
a documentary which is available in YouTube. It gives you a good indication and a good example of why policy and planning is important to avoid the impacts of over-tourism or unsustainable tourism. This is a new documentary that just came out recently as well, The Last Tourist, making the statement that travel has lost its way. In other words, at, at a time when travel was about um, uh, development and, and people-to-people -people relations, travel has become an indulgence now. It's become about consumption, where tourists don't care so much about the impact, where governments don't care so much about the local people, but more about the economic impact that they're making. So when we talk about tourism and the troubles with tourism, very often this is one of the key issues that comes up. To what extent has policy and planning ensured that the right type of tourism and the right level of tourism is taking place in a destination? This film uh, in, in, um, in, in Laos, in Southeast Asia, how tourists to a village change the lifestyle so considerably. And this is what we need to understand. Tourism changes things, but to what extent, and the type to, to to what extent, and then what is the type of change that communities um, will accept? Now, sometimes change happens quickly. Sometimes change happens slower. We see, for example, in Bali. Now, Bali is coming in, has brought in many many new laws to ensure that tourists behave themselves. But of course, what this means is tourists are saying, "I do not want to go to a destination." where um where there are too many rules upon me now while i'm here i am researching with my colleague dr anne hardy from the university of tasmania so this is yeah. dr anne hardy so okay, what i thought sure. we should do is we can have a discussion we have a uh, about sustainable tourism sure. and i will ask anne so anne, what do you think are the barriers to sustainable tourism development well, in what, which region of the world? Anywhere, in destinations generally. Let's okay. say in Australia or Japan. You've been to Japan. Anne was in Japan last year. Okay. I think probably one of the biggest barriers is finances. Because I think at the moment a lot of the tourism industry is recovering from um, the effects of the COVID pandemic, particularly in smaller destinations. And so I think finance is probably the biggest one, but the first one is probably knowledge. Yes. So knowledge first, and then probably finance is probably the second. Okay. second what about thing. in a country like Vanuatu? I just described to them where we are. Okay. What do you think is the biggest barrier to tourism development here? Oh, absolutely. Well, knowledge and finance, totally, because yeah. I think this country has been hit. When you say so knowledge, hard. you mean skills? and Or actually knowledge of what it is oh, okay. in the first yes. place yes. that, you know, it involves, um, you know, protecting the communities, protecting the environment, um, financial sustainability in terms of keeping the money in the in the in the location yes. and also visitor satisfaction so i think we often also forget about visitor mm -hmm. satisfaction and i think i don't think of sustainable tourism as a trinity i think it is four okay things. and yeah. of course um Anne was in japan last year mm -hmm. so when and all the students watching are in hokkaido right uh, Anne is from tasmania which is at the bottom of australia mm -hmm. so in terms of sustainable tourism in japan or the mm. tourism product in japan can yeah. you can you explain what you feel as a foreigner, yeah. how you feel about the Japanese tourism product? Okay, I feel like it's really undersold, actually, because I think the amazing thing about Japan as a destination, unlike many destinations around the world, is that it has a, as a traveller, when you go there, you get a really strong sense of, you know, you can have Japanese food, it's easy to buy Japanese labelled products, it's easy to, um, you know, engage with Japanese owned product, mm -hmm. that sort of um, uh, businesses. Um, and so actually a lot of what it already does is possibly sustainable tourism in that it's, you know, locally owned, money goes back into the country. So if you think about that, a lot of it's already been done, but it's not necessarily been mm -hmm. sold mm -hmm. as such so yeah what to you stood out about your experience in japan for me it was the culture it was actually the cultural experience well it was actually a complete blend of the cultural and natural experiences so the ability to go over to a place where there's you know you can barely many of the towns where we went there wasn't a lot of english and for me that was actually great because for me that seems it shows that 
um, this this is a destination that's actually managed to you know keep it be resilient in terms of maintaining its culture and its language. Mm. So that stood out for me. Um, the cultural aspects, the food, the the dress, um, and but also the natural environment was amazing, really amazing. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I got to my end sense. Yeah. You can stay there. So this is a, a last comment, a last uh, one of the last uh, documentaries that I think you should watch. It also talks about how as tourism develops over time, the kinds of decisions that undermine the sustainability of the place. So gringo trails, gringo is a is a Spanish word for uh, a foreigner or a white man mm. that comes to Latin America and how the growth in tourism has impacted both positive and negative the community there. Nearly finished then. Okay, so that's my concluding slide. Um, of course, because this is a recorded session, I will join you after this for question and answer. Perhaps uh, Dr. Mosan, I will call him, uh, will coordinate a um, uh, an answer, question and answer session. And the reason we recorded this is this is a problem. We know how important Wi-Fi is for travelers. I mean, everybody wants to share their photos. But in a country, especially less developed countries, but Wi-Fi is problematic. Um, uh, so hopefully I can join you for Q&A. Um, you know, as travelers, we're so used to being able to get on our phone and communicate with the rest of the world. But imagine being in a place where there's no Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi drops out. So in this large resort, I'm at one end and Anne's at the other end. To get the best Wi-Fi, we have to come and sit here in the restaurant to be able to do this. It's a constraint to tourism development because we know that Tourist satisfaction is important. The more small things that take away from their overall satisfaction, the less happier they become. Um, and we know that tourism and destination development also heavily relies on word of mouth. Mm, totally. Right. So with that said, thank you very much for listening. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll look forward to joining you for q and If we can say thank you to Dr. Anne Hardy from the University of Tasmania. <laughs> Anne is a very famous professor. Uh, Anne has, uh, ha Anne's work is about tracking tourists so if ever you uh you need to come up with a an essay about tourism technology and you want to find out about how we can understand tourist movement around a, a destination look for Anne hardy in in google scholar or in any 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 of the places you do your research you will find that information so with that said thank you very much everybody for listening now let's hope we can join you for q a at uh in a minute okay thank you Anne is a very famous professor. Uh, Anne has uh, had yes. about tracking tourists. So if ever you uh, you need to come up with a, an essay about tourism technology and you want to find out about how we can okay. understand tourist movement around a, a destination, look for Anne Hardy in, in Google Scholar or in any 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 of the yeah. places you do your research. Okay, hello, Joseph. Find that information. So with that uh, said, hi, hi, Monastan. Go to here. Okay. Okay. We can join you for Q&A at uh, uh sorry i have some tech okay. issues still thank you i'm finished playing the video out now it's fine so we received okay. two q and a but before that uh welcome back and congratulations you made it you found your wi-fi eventually and i have a lot of <laughs> things i want can to you make hear? a comment yes i can hear you loud and clear and uh it's it's really amazing to follow your research for more than five years before i I heard your presentation about a Pacific Island, then later about Japan now is about a post pandemic. Before I have a tons of questions, I will give the floor to our student. And there is also a technology yes. maintenance at eight o'clock. So we have more or less around 40 minutes for q and A. I I think that's quite enough. Okay. okay. So maybe let me read the first question okay. from Liu Yuping. He said, uh, she says, hi, Professor Joseph, thank you so much for your informative presentation. Uh, this is Liu Yuping, a doctor, first year student uh, at Hokkaido University. I have a question regarding the virtual tourism in the post pandemic era. So during the worldwide lockdown in 2020, various forms of virtual tourism have shown their importance. For example, watching live stream travel on TikTok was once very popular in China. In the post-pandemic era, as well as in the more remote future, so what extent do you think virtual tourism will contribute to the paradigm shift in the tourism industry? 
Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mosan, for the invitation. And thank you to everyone who's uh, here. Also, hi to Johan, Professor Johan, if you're there. Um, as you before that, um, I would like to apologize for the quality of the Wi-Fi, right? Um, I was supposed to do this class um, in Australia, but unfortunately, my travel plans to Japan changed. I'm, I'm here for the Asian Development Bank, and we are looking at tourism development. Behind me, you will see the beautiful tropical environment, and the, the, the sea is not too far away. I wish you could all be here. It's very warm. Uh, but I'm, it's warm in, in, in Hokkaido as well, I believe. So about virtual tourism and, and the, the pandemic shift, I think what is, what is, what is evident is that um, uh, virtual tourism obviously um, had perfect, um, uh, a perfect set of circumstances. People couldn't travel. There was a shift to the online environment. So virtual travel um, gained uh, popularity at that point. But the question I think uh, Li Yuping you, you raise it po is possibly one, and, and uh, maybe I can try and paraphrase or guess, that perhaps you're asking, is virtual tourism something that's going to continue to strengthen over time? Um, and if I may, I may compare that to something here that we, this is one of the reasons we're here. During the pandemic, domestic tourism around the world increased quite rapidly. Japan was one example. And that's because people weren't able to travel overseas, right? Is that going to be a permanent situation? Or will people now continue to travel overseas because they have the potential to do that and the, and the ability? Now, I think it's the same with virtual tourism. I, I'm not the school where I think tourism is a people-to-people -people exchange, face-to-face -face rather than virtual and online. I think there's a place for virtual tourism in terms of um, when you study marketing, tourists find themselves in the dreaming phase, right? When they're looking at going somewhere. I think virtual tourism can be good at the dreaming phase. It can also be good at providing information um, and, and um, demonstrating people's experiences as a way of enticing people to go to the destination. Is it going to replace face-to-face -face travel? Very unlikely, I would say. For example, if we look at the data between travel between North America and Britain, that's already reached about 95% of the, the pre-COVID capacity. We see in countries like Thailand, um, pre-COVID capacities are increased, even in Japan. I think inbound tourism arrivals have increased a lot quicker than they anticipated, and especially will do this when, when Chinese travelers regain the confidence to travel again. So if I was, um, if I was a man, a betting man, you know, betting money on whether virtual tourism will continue to, uh, to, to, to flourish or not, I would probably say, um, uh, it will continue to be a part of driving tourism demand, but I, I doubt that it will ever replace the desire for face-to-face -face encounters that we tourists um, have. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, three more questions piling up, so let's do it one by one. So another question from uh, Dale Hanek. I'm sorry if I pronounce your name right. He says, excellent webinar regarding financing. Why have governments ev evidently been uh, slow to request World Bank IMF funds? Yes, very good question, uh, uh, Dale. And I think Dale is a, um, uh, um, a, a LinkedIn um, uh, a friend who I've never met in person. But thank you, Dale, for your question. Thank you for coming to this webinar. Um, this is a very important question, especially here where I am in, in Vanuatu, a uh, small island developing state where um, uh, the World Bank, uh, the Asian Development Bank, um, uh, JICA, the Japanese Development Agency, COICA, the Korean Development Agency, USAID, um, the British Development Agency, DFID, they've all seen tourism as a vehicle for development. Why have they, why have they been slow, as Dale asks? Well, there's a very good reason. Very often, um, organizations, or let's call them bilateral organizations, multilateral organizations like the World Bank and the IMF or the Asian Development Bank, they are often are keen to, to provide financing that is evidence-based. Now, while, while evidence uh, of the long-term impacts of COVID are very difficult to understand, they remain very shy in terms of engaging in investing in tourism. I mean, here, Dr. Anne Hardy and I uh, are on this assignment for the Asian Development Bank. There is a desire to invest more in tourism in the industry, but our job here is to try and build on the evidence that's, that's, uh, that's very thin on the ground. 
So when we talk about development agencies, when we talk about investors, when we talk about someone who may be wanting to develop a resort, evidence drives good decision making, evidence drives policy and planning. And in the absence of evidence, making decisions becomes a bit tricky. So that's the reason, Dale, that I can see from my perspective. Okay, Back thank you very much. Okay, next one is uh, Takuya Okochi. So uh, I think the number of tourists will continue to fluctuate due to a sudden disaster or pandemic in the future, especially when there are few tourists how should we keep the employment on tourism and keep the quality uh, as tourist destinations? How do you evaluate the idea of collaboration with other industry, for instance, work caution, business plus tourism, resort therapy, healthcare plus tourism, and others? Uh, um, uh, Takuya-san, thank you for your question. Um, there are several parts to it, and I will try and answer that quickly within the time constraints. So you are right. We are in a, in a situation of um, uh, 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 more uncertainty than normal, right? You know, the question remains, are we past the pandemic or is the pandemic still with us? Now, we will have varying discussions around this. Um, so, you know, we found that when the pandemic occurred, Globally, we were, we were very much underprepared to deal with this. We had never anticipated something of this magnitude. What if we have another one that's, that's unintended and un, um, unforeseen? Will we be able to deal with it? Now, we hope that the pandemic has given us an ability to be forward-looking, to be able to create scenarios where there are particular crises and we're able to deal with them. But of course, as crises tend to be, we don't really know what the full extent will be yet. So I agree. We operate in a, in a climate of, of great uncertainty. And then beyond the pandemic, there are issues around climate change. Um, so your, your next question is, especially when there are few tourists, should we keep the employment on tourists and keep the quality as tourist destinations? Now, that is a very interesting question because in a destination like this, as recovery takes place, it's quite evident that people employees in the tourism industry have left the tourism industry to go and work elsewhere. Um, they've dis discovered high paying jobs in other industries. Um, in, in Vanuatu, as an example, many have gone to Australia and New Zealand to work in the farming industry where they will get paid far more. Um, so um, uh, this is a really important question. Should we continue promoting tourism when, it, when, when it's still recovering? Um, I think we should, because soon enough, we see the recovery will take place, I would think, quite rapidly. And are we going to be prepared to have the workforce on the ground? Because if you don't have the workforce to deliver tourism experiences, then that has an impact on satisfaction, that has impa an impact on capacity. We see, for example, when, when borders started opening over 18 months to two years ago, airlines were facing this very problem. Staff had gone to other industries. And then being able to restart and retrain staff is a very difficult situation. So it's a balancing act. How much do we invest in our employees in maintaining and keeping them? How much do we, do we save on employment costs on the other hand until tourism recovers? Now, many tourism organizations and in many destinations, we see that the industry has just done that. They've let employees go. But suddenly, as the demand has, has, has kicked up, as it has increased, they found themselves running behind because they did not have the employees. So this is a very tricky question for the tourism industry, for us as university professors. We have to ask ourselves, what kind of employment futures will tourism students have? And, you know, has the tourism industry learned from this? And will they reward tourism employees far better than uh, they have been in the past? And this is really, in a, in a developing country like this one, Tourism provides real alternatives for employment because there are not in there are very few other other opportunities. But even even in that situation, there is a labor force crisis. And I think if anything's going to going to prevent the crisis, but to prevent the the tourism industry from recovering quickly, it's the labor force crisis. Now, you, if I can add, go to your last question, you talk about workation, resort therapy, healthcare, tourism, and others. Now, certainly workation or digital nomads um, uh, increased quite rapidly because of the, of the pandemic. Uh, uh, wellness tourism and healthcare tourism did so as well. So while some sectors of the tourism industry 
uh, had a downturn, other sectors became more relevant. Now, will this continue uh, into the future? This is a very difficult thing to kind of forecast in a very uncertain environment. But I would say, um, when it comes to workation and digital nomads, the pandemic has taught us that there are other ways of working, that we don't all have to go into an office. For example, here, not here, but in Australia where I live, um, there are empty city office buildings because people aren't going into work. What's going to be happening with them in the near future? You know, some organizations are saying, we want employees to come back to work, productivity is down. So I think there is still a little, little bit more to develop in the next couple of years before we can see that uh, becoming a permanent thing. Thank you, Mohsan. Okay, well, there's another question from Dali, and uh, he would like to know what could be the best steps to accelerate the transition to sustainable or regenerative tourism? That's a good Yes, question. thank you, Dale. Yeah, that's a very good question. And you know, the bigger question that many are asking is, what is the difference between sustainable and regenerative tourism, right? Is there a difference? Now, there's also the problem with regenerative tourism. It's become this popular thing that that you can now see in marketing. And to some degree, it gives you the feeling of greenwashing, right? But if we could first start with this defining sustainable tourism and regenerative tourism. Sustainable tourism comes, you know, from um, the 1987 um, Brundtland report on sustainable development, where it was about intergenerational equity. In other words, is what we're doing today going to compromise the planet for the next generation, right? That's what sustainable development and its, its, uh, its origins ask. Regenerative tourism has become very popularized in the, re in the last couple of years. Now, regenerative development is not a new thing. Many indigenous communities have been practicing this. Many rural communities in Japan have been practicing this. Permaculture, uh, permaculturists uh, in agriculture have been practicing this, where the idea is what we do and the activities we, we undertake um, should improve rather than degrade the, the environment we're in. So for example, if I, if I have a, 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 a corn farm, the idea would be that what I'm doing um, uh, improves the state of the land rather than degrading it, which is the common case for many industrial agricultural practices, right? Where we use artificial or we use uh, supplementary fertilizers to, to re replenish the earth that we've had all of the, 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 the good things taken out of. Now, regenerative tourism suggests that with tourism, we can make the destination better. For example, here, we're saying that with regenerative tourism, the, the, the reef, which is about 100 meters away, will have the ability to regenerate itself. We're saying that the, 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 pro, the products, the, the crops that we get from the land leaves the land in a better state. We're saying that the fishing we're doing, we are mindful that we are not overfishing so that the, the uh, and we are not catching fish that are too small so that we allow the fisheries uh, stock to replenish itself. Now, um, how do we accelerate this? Now, um, I think we see this already accelerating from an ideas point of view, from a research point of view, from a tourism policy and planning. But in, to my mind, Dale, the way we can accelerate regenerative tourism is changing tourist behavior. I think usually we start from the top and we say policy and planning is important and we work our way down. I think tourist behavior is working from the bottom up because if we change tourist behavior and we change the demand for certain products, we then um, force the industry to, to provide those products for us, right? But, you know, do I have faith in consumers to want to make good decisions? I mean, it's very difficult to have faith in consumers generally because across the planet, you know, we are largely living consumerist lifestyles, consumptive lifestyles. We see problems with fast fashion, as an example. We see problems with um, uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, um, uh, agriculture, right? So all the while we see that despite the calls for a better way of living and existing with the planet through regenerative tourism, as an example, I think without bottom-up pressure, the top will continue to do what it does. So how do we create bottom-up pressure? I think it comes through education, building awareness and changing people's attitudes. We see a destination like Bali trying to do this now, right? Trying to make tourists more responsible. Will this work? Will tourists say, thank you, but we don't want to be told what to do. We will go somewhere else. I don't know. 
But in short, Dale, I think a bottom-up approach is probably going to work best for sustainable and regenerative tourism. Okay, thank you. And uh, when we, uh, we talk a lot about consumption and production, there is a great question arise by Carol mentioned about uh, the community side. He says, thank you, Joseph. Appreciate your focus on the role of COVID-19 pandemic and the pandemic in general, mass having redefining the doom. Uh, demand tourism paradigm and avoid its impacts. However, I feel there was uh, too much uh, focus on the visitors and industry side through the presentation. Do you not think it is important to stress the uh, centrality of the local communities in a holistic more than human perspective for making post-COVID-19 tourism really sustainable? Yes. Thank you for your, your comments. I, I, I do agree. Unfortunately, with because of the time constraints, you know, you, I would be I wouldn't be able to talk about everything, but you are right. This is what I mean by bottom-up pressure as well. Bottom-up pressure from, from the traveler market, the tourists themselves, and bottom-up pressure from communities to demand that policy and planning recognizes their individual needs. But you're right, very often there's a trade-off. Um, and we see many destinations. The first thing they often do when in, in, in crisis is let's think of a new marketing plan. Let's create a new destination image. Let's create a new destination icon, right? Let's increase demand. But very often the focus on driving up demand is not matched by the focus on ensuring that the supply side, this is the communities, are able to deal with that increased demand, but also the change in requirements of that demand. I do agree that that the the centrality of local communities is important because without the local communities you don't have a tourism product right but while that may may be may be uh, perfectly reasonable to say in theory you look at a city like barcelona where i've been working with colleagues on on over tourism right despite local communities being very vocal about what they want um what we see is that the rise in tourism did not address their needs we we saw you know we saw with the rise in tourism many people were staying in airbnbs and short stay apartments and those the owners of those apartments did not live in barcelona they were in amsterdam they were in london they were in other places so while they were benefiting from the rise in tourism they were not dealing with the costs of tourism themselves of course we see that in kyoto as well as i said before with kanko kogai now how do we ensure communities are heard sufficiently now very often when we say local communities we assume that the whole local that the local community is the what is one this is not always the case communities often disagree as to what is possible for example in a developer not too far from here there's a local land owning group some of them agree that a five-star resort should land and they should be able to lease the land to the investor for 75 years while others are concerned that if they lease the land, they won't have access to the fishing ground. They won't have access to the traditional lands that they have. Very often, when we speak of local communities, there is a trade-off being made. You know, and, and as I said in the presentation, inevitably, tourism changes things. You can't expect to have a tourism industry and have everything stay the same. Things will change. Tourism has an impact. Now, while on the one hand, it may have an economic impact, the trade-off is that it may have other social and environmental impacts and the question for local communities is how do we balance the trade-offs what trade-offs do we choose who decides what the trade-offs are and this is this is this is a challenge carol because you know communities are not homogenous they don't all think the same they don't all want the same thing and sometimes you know you ask the question are communities the best people to make the decision on a on a on a on a, on a tourism development plan um, not always. Um, sometimes communities will recruit consultants and external parties to deal with, with this on them. And we see this here. For example, in this country, you cannot buy land, but you can lease land for 75 years. So many people say 75 years, that's at least one or two generations where we won't be able to change anything. So I do agree that local communities have a centrality, but I also think that travelers have a centrality as well, because if we are addressing what the local community's needs are without changing the behaviors of tourists, I think we're addressing one thing, but not addressing the other. If we are not going further up into tourism policy and planning and having policymakers and planners consider these uh, local community priorities seriously, 
then it's a problem, right? So it's almost like a moving, um, uh, a moving piece of machinery where all the parts are constantly moving, right? We can't always stand still and say, okay, now we're at a point where we're sustainable. We will stop and everything will continue to be this way. That doesn't, that's not how it happens in the real world. We are constantly adjusting. And the, one of the words I mentioned in the presentation was resilience, right? Resilience is about adaptive capacities where destinations and people are constantly adjusting to the changing external and internal, internal circumstances and dealing with the external shocks like a crisis, an environmental crisis or an economic crisis and internal shocks, whether it be economic, environmental or political. But thank you, Carlo, for the question. Okay, we have five more questions. Do you need a break, Joseph? I feel no, like no, no, no. Thank you. No, uh, enough. Okay, the next uh, one. Here, here in the here in right. the Pacific, uh, twenty minutes to ten at night, so it's still very right. early for me. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. So, next question is: What are some key benefits of fostering, uh, fostering international tourism collaborations between countries, and how can it contribute to the growth and development of both nations' tourism industries? Right. Well, in theory, <laughs> you know, there are many who say that international tourism and the people-to-people uh, -people exchanges can build peace and better understanding between peoples. I think that that's true to some degree, but I also think that international tourism and evidently sometimes um, reinforces stereotypes. You know, that hosts have of tourists and tourists have of hosts. Um, so I think we can't be certain that international tourism is a force for entirely for good. Right, because we know um, that's not necessarily the case, as we can see from the evidence. Um, uh, but certainly, I think when I think of my students going on international field trips, it helps them understand a world beyond their own borders. It helps them look beyond their own uh, um, uh, countries and, and regions and helps them understand more broadly how other people live. For example, my own PhD, I was looking at the extent to which international tourism has positive development outcomes on communities that they deal with. On one hand, they did, they provided jobs. Uh, they provided uh, foreign direct investment. They brought in um, uh, foreign exchange earnings. However, and there's always been a however, right? On the other hand, what it did was it, it led to inflationary impacts in the country. What it did, it le led to people being alienated from their land. Because as you can imagine, an investor comes in and says, we'll give you a million dollars for that land that previously people didn't do anything with. They took it, but for 75 years, they were not able to get access to that land. As you can imagine, as generations pass through, that becomes problematic, right? We see things like sex tourism in Southeast Asia, which I've worked on, arising, not only because of international tourism, but international tourism helps fuel it, as well as other, other aspects. Um, we see, for example, anthropologists talk about the demonstration effect, where in some countries, youth compare the, the, the undesirable behavior of tourists. You know, um, for example, in, 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 in Laos, where, where full moon parties were quite common, you know, where young people would go to a town, like a backpacker town, they would drink alcohol, consume drugs, and do a lot of those things. Um, that typically in Laos is not done. And, and the concern was that over a period, the youth in the country were looking at this and, and aspiring to doing the same thing. So there are benefits and costs of both of international tourism collaboration between countries. For example, if we were talking about geopolitics, I think, for example, countries that are often at odds with each other, conflicting with each other, which with each other might be good. For example, imagine if more Americans were going to China and more Chinese were going to America, and they were doing so in a peaceful way to visit each other and to learn about each other. I think that could lead to certainly to better relations between the countries. Um, however, you know, I may be <laughs> I may be too optimistic that that might be the case. Imagine if we went to Russia. You know, I've been to Russia, and I know what I see on the news isn't always reflective of what Russia is as a country because it's a very big country. I have I have Russian friends, I have Ukrainian friends. And I, both countries are, are, are wonderful places to visit. But if we only relied on the often biased news reports we get of the country, we lead to very difficult and understanding of people and places. We, we lead to what people like 
Um, and I think hope that. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm very positive that if we visit people with an open mind, we become um, closer together. We can build closer relations because in, inevitably in the end, we are pretty much all the same. We have, we have religions, we have children, we have husbands, we have wives, we have aspirations. We all want to live a good life, right? So perhaps um, if we visited each other more, we might be able to drive a different politics, but that's a very optimistic way to look at things. Okay, next question from Johan. Thanks, Joseph, for your great presentation. Very enjoyable. You say that decision makers have to make decisions based on evidence. However, there seems to be a blindness to evidence that does not support growth uh, agendas, such as the UN IPCC 6 assignment report. Thus, how long will decision makers continue turning a blind eye to the climate emergency when all the evidence is already on the table that change needs to be done now? Yeah, thank, thank you, Johan Sensei, for your question, and I, I hope you're well. Um, yes, you know, um, it, it takes me back to that documentary that Al Gore released called In An Inconvenient Truth, right? Policymakers do say they want evidence, but very often it has to be the right kind of evidence that in many ways justifies their decisions, right? And that's, this is what I mean about the political culture in which we live, where politicians are elected on one um, uh, idea or platform, and then when they govern, they do something else. Certainly with uh, the IPC six, sixth assessment, you know, you, you're right. Um, uh, they're turning a blind eye. They're thinking that um, we can continue down uh, the path that we're on. And I say this, and your question is very relevant, because for me as a researcher, I, and, and Anne Hardy, who's behind me over here, we're asking ourselves the same thing, right? As researchers who are critical and who, who examine the industry closely, how can we best play a part in, in, in getting the change we need? Some of, the, my, some of my researcher colleagues would stay away from doing projects with the Asian Development Bank or the World Bank because they see them as doing what you say, um, uh, Johan, turning a blind eye. For me, I think for us to be able to influence them and to drive change, we need to be inside the, inside the, the, the bubble rather than outside the bubble throwing stones at them. I think that's the way we can drive change. Now, something like the IPC sixth assessment is, is an interesting one because we see researchers trying to make, you know, trying to advocate about the need uh, for change. It's a slow process because there are many powerful influences that are stopping that from happening, whether it be the fossil fuel industries, the airline industry, um, uh, and whoever it might be, right? And it takes us back to the one of the points, Carlos' question earlier. You know, we rely on policymakers to make the changes for us. Where's the responsibility that we have as consumers to, to, to start the change? You know, if we if we blindly consume the way we do, if we drive our our our, our fuel our, our fossil fuel cars without thinking about the process, if we continue to, you know, for example, I will say this openly, when I was working in Wakayama and I had to get to Tokyo, I would always get the train. Right, but I had many colleagues who would say, "No, it's quicker to get the get a plane." But when we think about our carbon consumption, is very different, right? I sense that there is more avenues to change than just relying on policymakers. I think there's enormous will, there is enormous power at the grassroots for us to make change. You know, imagine if the work of Greta Thunberg was multiplied five hundred thousand times or a million times. You know, we will probably enforce change. Do we need a revolution? <laughs> I, I guess we do, but we've just come through a pandemic and the last thing we need is more disruption, right? But I think, Johan, I think there are many avenues to change that are top-down and bottom-up. And I think top-down change will be slow. I think bottom-up change can be quicker, but it relies on us as consumers, as travelers to make the right decisions. Like, you know, for me, flying to Australia here um, is, is, you know, is quite a considerable distance across the Pacific, four hours. I assess my, I look at my carbon and I, and I look at what I'm doing and I, I have to, I have to weigh up the priorities, right? Can we do this work remotely? Can I do this work sitting in my office in Australia? 
um, dealing with uh, stakeholder consultations, develop, uh, helping develop development plans, trying to dig deep into finding out what needs to be done. I don't know. But it once again goes back to, can we do virtual research? Can we do virtual development work? I think not. I feel like, you know, uh, the, the human connection is very important in being able to make change. I think if we try to do this virtually or remotely, there's a, there's a distance that we don't cross. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that I come here to Vanuatu every, every two or three months, right? But what it means is we're once again trading off the costs and benefits of what we're doing against the change that we hope is coming. So, Johan, finally to your question, I think, and all the students watching, I think bottom up, influencing our communities, our networks, our families. My students always say to me when they attend my classes, they cannot travel again the way they used to. They cannot lie on a beach and have no cares whatsoever. They are now worried about their impact. If I pay for this, what happens? If I bought a drink and there's a plastic straw on it, am I being part of the problem? So I think when we educate people, we make them conscious that they can have a small part in the change that we need. Perhaps we might get there. Okay, thank you. Uh, we still have a lot of questions, but we have only 10 okay. minutes left. I will yeah, read two more questions, then it's my final question, okay? okay. So question from Thang Tran, sorry if I pronounce your uh, name right. You mentioned that the last time we saw a paradigm shift after 9-11, so people started to travel with more safety and security. It sounds like the paradigm shift was resulted from the changes in policies rather than from the view of travelers. How about this time? Will the paradigm shift only happen if policymakers decide that there will be one? Thank you. Thank you, T. Trent, for your question. You're very, you're very right. We were pushed into, into adopting a new way of travel, right? I, I don't know how many people were, were around or were, were adults. <laughs> if, you, if you're an undergraduate student now, that's 20 years ago or 22 years ago, um, you might have still been... Um, in, in your in, in, in nappies with your parents. But it did. It forced us into making very um, uh, and forced us into traveling in a different way. We had no decisions over the new security arrangements that arised. We just had to do it. And guess what? Over a period of years now, it comes second nature, right? Of course, we complain about it, but it's something that we do anyway. Um, has, the, has there been a paradigm shift in travel? Well, my observations um, are that, unfortunately, that's a pessimistic way of thinking. Here, we see tourists veering back to the same things. Last summer, I, I, I was uh, visiting research at a, at a university in Spain for a couple of months, and we see uh, in, in, in um, destinations like uh, Barcelona and others, tourists were returning to the same habits, the same demands. Um, and at the same time, we saw industry responding in the same ways, right? Because they were desperate to recover, you know. The you know, if you're desperate to recover, the first thing you're thinking about is e economic viability. Yes, all these big picture items will come later. Um, so we see the industry and the travelers kind of returning to to, to formal ways of, of doing tourism. I, but I think it's still too early to say whether some of the changes we observe are going to be ongoing. For example. Will tourists retain their confidence to travel? Like I don't, on the plane that I travel on, masks masks are optional. And only two people were wearing a mask on the entire plane. Sanitizing your hand is optional. Very few people use sanitizer. It's like we've forgotten what we've gone through. So I think, um, I think it's early days, but I'm very pessimistic that we have made a shift to a new way of doing tourism. Okay, uh, one last guest question from Kat. And in exchange of the question, I uh, want to ask, in what ways has social media influenced travel behavior and the perception of different destinations? Yes, I think it's really uh, 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 from Takoya-san. Oh, uh, social media, no. That, uh, who, who asked that question, Mosan? The last one, Kate. Oh, from Kate. Yeah. Yes, I think that's a really important question, Kate. Thank you for that question. But I think it only it doesn't apply to the entire traveler market. You know, so for example, my mother in her 80s, she doesn't pay any attention to social media, so it wouldn't influence her traveler choice, right? But certainly social media has a, has, has a strong influence over Generation Z and probably Generation Y as well, and probably Generation X like me, right? Um, I think, um, you know, we're all so attached to our phones, right? What do we do when we land in a new destination? What's the first thing we do? 
that's a rhetorical question. We look for free Wi-Fi, right? We look to we look to join, <laughs> the, 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 we look to send messages and post photos. So I think, yes, social media has been important for stimulating travel to certain de destinations. In many cases, especially what influencers have done, they've stimulated to, de to travel to destinations without the destinations having control over that, right? Now, I think that's problematic. So for example, there was a campaign to say that if you post an Instagram, you shouldn't uh, geotag it. You shouldn't say where it is. Otherwise, you will end up having lots of people going there, right? In Australia, where I live, for example, there's, a, there's something called the Pink Lake in the state I'm living in, Victoria. The, the, the town in which this lake um, turns pink once a year suddenly had busloads of tourists, Chinese tourists ascending on the town. And that's because someone had posted a photo of it in Chinese social media in WeChat. And without the town even being prepared, busloads of tourists were descending on the town, having them totally underprepared. Now, I think social media has both good and bad. Um, can we control it? I mean, this is the question, right? This is the broader question. Can we control what Mr. Musk does with Twitter? Can we control what um, Mr. I can't remember his name now with Facebook? Um, you know, can we control what they do? Can we? Con and now we see the rise of AI. Can we control the, the 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 misinformation that might arise from AI? I think we're in a we're we're, we're in a uh, an era where um, uh, there is a, a very interesting shift going on. To what extent will what we know? be shaped by social media and AI? And to what extent will this all be based in truth? Or will be, it will be based in marketing narrative or political narratives to suit whoever is generating this, this, um, this um, outcomes? I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's a very important question. Yes, thank you so much, Joseph. I will have a concluding question because uh, each of your slides, I feel like I can ask more questions, but uh, only only four minutes left. So back to uh, my time in Hiroshima University, a few years ago, we're still teaching sustainable tourism based on the UNWTO 2014 indicator books, the green one. Then we realized that's too old. Then later I visited you back to 2018 in Monash University. It's great to see you are teaching uh, your yours paper and also Alan's paper about tourism resilience at the uh, sustainable tourism class. Now, after listening to your uh, new thoughts about the post-pandemic related topic, I would speak up for most of the students here because a lot of students, they seem really uh, having difficulties to research tourism, especially sustainable and uh, regenerative tourism after COVID-19. If you have any suggestion or implication for students, how they can study and research uh, sustainable tourism, at the post-pandemic yeah. period. That will be great help. Thank you. Well, my recommendation uh, is, is to read widely, both academic sources and non-academic sources. Um, be, be curious about what's going on. I mean, the, the, the change is happening so rapidly, right? For you as students, it's important to constantly be at the edge of the developments. You know, so for example, I always say to my students, join Twitter. Um, join LinkedIn, follow people who are working in sustainable tourism to be able to know what, the, what their thoughts are. Um, uh, for example, if you, if, if you go to Twitter, think of your favorite destinations and, and travel organizations, follow them to see what's going on. Knowledge is only built by time invested in trying to gather the knowledge, right? I don't think you can sit at your computer and everything will ma magically appear <laughs> to you. I don't think AI is the answer either. You know, I don't think uh, chat GPT is the answer for everything because we know it's still a work in progress. I also think, um, you know, while on the one hand, we're talking about decarbonization and travel. If as a student, you have the opportunity to take holidays and travel for a long period. For example, if you're in Japan, you know, go across to Taiwan, which is very close. If, 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 uh, if, if you have the opportunity to go to Taiwan, that helps you learn about a different country. If you're based in Japan, go to China go to Korea. Travel these days um, is one of the ways it's changing is that people are not traveling long haul. In other words, Australians aren't going to Iceland so much anymore. Americans aren't coming to Australia. What we are doing is traveling closer to the countries around us. So I would say travel is the best educator, but at the same time, it helps 
um, put into perspective many of the things that you are looking at in your lecture, right? Because travel is one of those things. Can we learn about travel in lab conditions? Can we learn about tourism impact in lab conditions? I'm not so sure. I think it, it's something that face-to-face that -face and getting our hands dirty on the ground, getting our feet in the, in the water, shaking hands with people, understanding um, where they're coming from is, I think, the key to understanding travel. Because travel is not just about tourism, right? Travel is about education. It's about building relationships. It's about realizing our own potential. Many people of my age, when we were undergraduates, we traveled and we came back home with a better perspective on the world. So I think um, follow Twitter. You can follow me in Twitter if you want or LinkedIn. I, I post far too much than I need to and I spend far too much time online than I should. But but I, I do do that. One of the other things, and I, my last comment, um, Mosan, if I may, is that I'm also the co-chair of the World Economic Forum Sustainable Tourism Council, and soon we'll be releasing a podcast and uh, and uh, and a series of discussion papers, uh, and they will be quite useful. Tourism Geographies, the journal I edit, we have a podcast, so I suggest you look at the podcast and and download the episodes and listen to them, read the papers. Look, there are multiple ways to gather information, and I think the time you invest in it is important okay so, I'm, I'm conscious of the time so that's yeah yeah no problem answer. thank you very much because we have a faculty network maintenance soon so i have to stop this session but in the end i'm really agreed what you said we can't do virtually research and presentation so human connection is very important so we really need to invite you on site to have another lecture in future also, yeah. thanks a lot for for uh, Professor Anna, right? Uh, Anna, Anna, Hartley. Yeah, uh, maybe I should invite her for another guest lecture next time. And uh, in the end, uh, okay. Hello, thank you very much. Hi. I really like your interactive session, and it's really uh, ah. yes. Sorry oh, about the, the Wi-Fi connection, but uh, okay. Now I will close to this session okay. and uh, thank you very much to joining the number 17 tourism online forum series and very welcome you uh, to meet you in future okay have a good night everybody thank you very much joseph thank you everyone thank you for everyone thank you for your questions thank take you. care bye bye